Malachi chapter 1, verses 11 through 14, God's word says this. For from the rising of the sun to its setting, my name will be great among the nations. And in every place, incense will be offered to my name and a pure offering. For my name will be great among the nations, says the Lord of hosts. But you profane it when you say that the Lord's table is polluted and its fruit, that is, its food may be despised. But you say, what a weariness this is. And you snort at it, says the Lord of hosts. You bring what has been taken by violence or is lame or sick. And this you bring as your offering. Shall I accept that from your hand, says the Lord? Cursed be the cheat who has a male in his flock and vows it. And yet sacrifices to the Lord what is blemished. For I am a great king, says the Lord of hosts, and my name will be feared among the nations. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, your name is mighty. It is to be worshipped and adored because it represents who you are. It is to be proclaimed, Lord, because you are to be proclaimed. Lord, we are here as those who have heard your name. And you have been made known to us through the preaching of your word, through various Christians, a servant of your word, and we have come to trust in the name of Jesus Christ as our Savior. We have called upon that name, and there is no other name among men where we can be saved. It is the name of our beloved Savior, Jesus Christ. Lord, you are calling people all around the world to fear and to love your name and to worship your name. And so I pray, God, that we would be those people I pray, God, that we would help bring more people like that into your kingdom who love their king and they fear his great name. And so, Lord, as we look at your word this morning, I pray, God, that you would change our hearts, that you would let us to know that we are meeting with you right now and that this is a serious moment, a a holy moment where you are present with us by the preaching of your word. As you are declaring to your people and to the world what you want them to know. And so I pray, God, that we would listen, that we would take heed, that we would open up our minds and hearts to receive it, that your spirit would help us to interpret it, that those who have dead hearts would be made alive so that they can receive what is spiritual, Lord, and believe upon Christ and be saved. We pray this for your name's sake. And in the name of Jesus, we pray this. Amen. Church, please be seated. The sermon is titled... God's love for his name via the nations. Since 1996, I've been blessed to help pastor several churches in California. One in Hesperia, one in Los Angeles, one in Victorville. And the church that I had started in uh, way back when, in uh, 2007 in Victorville, ended up merging with this church. And... One of the distinct marks of each of these churches was their diversity in ethnicity and diversity in different people that represented different nations. By nation, I mean a group of people that have a common language, an ethnicity, a common ancestry, a common history, a common culture, a nationality. That's what I mean by nation. And technically speaking, a nation is different than a country. A country is made up of citizens under a particular government. And that country may or may not include people from all sorts of nations. Okay? For example, I hope you make sense of that. The United States is a particular country with a particular form of government and leaders made up of many people, of many nationalities, of many nations. Does that make sense? Nations um, and, and country are different. And I want to make that distinction. There are some countries that are very different from the United States. We're a melting pot of many nations, okay? There are some countries that are different in that they're primarily a country with very little nations. It's primarily one nation in that country, one nationality. And so when I use the word nation this morning, I want you to know that I'm strictly referring to nationalities, even if I mention the name of a country, okay? In the churches that I've been blessed to help lead, I can tell you that churches have been made up of people that have ancestry from the Philippines and South Africa, Egypt and Germany, Mexico and Guatemala, Brazil, Korea, 
and Taiwan, Iran, Lebanon, El Salvador, Peru, Italy, and Jamaica. Those are just the ones that I can think of as I think back on my brothers and sisters in the various churches that I was a part of. Now, I'm sure that there are a few more nations that are represented here today. Maybe you heard yours called out. I'm curious, out of the ones that I mentioned, maybe you would raise your hand if I didn't call the nation that you hail from. Would you raise your hand? All right. Uh, Israel was one of the ones that I didn't, right? Oh, Russia. All right. I was way wrong. All right. Steve's been lying to us this whole time. He's Russian, not Jewish. All right. Let's make sure we call him onto the carpet on that, Brian. All right. Uh, what was the nation that you're at hell from? Nicaragua. Nicaragua. That's another one. Right. And maybe there's a few others here that are represented. Anybody else? I'm just curious. This is your only chance to speak now or forever hold your peace. Okay. All right. Well, today and every Sunday, there are nationalities who gather in buildings like this and sometimes in caves. And these people are praising the one true God and they are honoring his name. They come to God through Jesus Christ, his son, the second person of the Godhead, and they adore their creator, their savior, because of his saving grace. And while that is happening, there are people all over the globe who are doing different things. Instead of honoring the name of God, they are rejecting his name. They are rejecting Christ as redeemer. People from all nations are doing this. Well, simultaneously, people from all nations are still praising God. These unbelievers, they believe themselves to be good people. And they believe that they're on good terms with God through the good deeds that they bring to God. They bring their self-effort to God and they think they're okay with God. Either that or they deny the existence of God. And then they look at us and they say that those Christians are superstitious or they theorize that we carry some vestigial need for belief in God that somehow kept us alive during the evolutionary process. And that's why we had this belief for God because it kept us alive. And now that we are where we are, well, we no longer need that belief to sustain us. And so they deem us foolish or they deem, deem belief in God some remnant of evolution. And there certainly is a sharp distinction between those who love God and those who don't. We know that God loves his name. We've talked about that before. God loves his name. He loves his person. There is no higher being in God's affection than God. We are not God's God. He does not love us above himself. He is to be worshipped by all. And he worships himself, if you will. And so his name is above all. He loves it. And we see that to, to not love God is to not love his name. And today we're going to see that concept in the word again. We saw it last time as we looked through Malachi. And we're going to see why it is that some people love God and some people don't. Why why some do not honor his name. As we have looked at Malachi, I know this is maybe a a newer book to be preached to for some of you. Um, As we've looked at it, I've tried to help you look at it through the Old Testament lenses of the covenants. Okay, if you remember that. The Old Testament promises, the big ones, the vows that God has made. But I want to remind you that Malachi takes place after a 70-year period in which God was punishing the Israelites for their breaking one of these covenants, the Mosaic Covenant. They, they had turned their backs on God. God's, God let them uh, be overcome by the Babylonians. They were taken into captivity. But Malachi takes place after the 70-year punishment period. And the Israelites, they've been rebuilding their life. They've been allowed to return back to their promised land, the land that God promised them. They've rebuilt the temple and the foundation of the temple. They've rebuilt the wall. They're rebuilding their sacrificial system and their culture, and they're living according to the covenant that God made, the Mosaic Covenant. Yet, somehow they've started to become complacent once again in their living for God and living according to the covenant that he made. And so Malachi is a rebuke to the people of uh, Israel during this time period, and he rebukes them through the prophet Malachi. And that's what this prophecy is partially about, this, this prophecy of Malachi. Now, as, a, as the people have rebuilt the temple and the priesthood's reestablished, they are now offering sacrifices to God. Yet God has had some problems with Israel, and he's going to address their sins. The first problem that we saw that God had was is, with Israel was that they doubted his love for him. God said to them, basically, you guys don't think that I love you. You say that I don't love you. And then God proved to them how he loved them. 
All right, that was another sermon, the very first sermon that we saw in Malachi, so we're not going to revisit that. Then God moves on to the second accusation that he has with them, the second problem he has with them. And in this problem, he says, you despise my name. So the first problem, you don't believe I love you. The second one, it's you that doesn't love me. That's the problem. Well, how how do we not love you, Lord? How have we despised your name? They respond back. God says, by offering blemish sacrifices to me. So that's what we talked about in our last sermon. Today's sermon is a carryover from that same idea, but we're going to expound upon it a little bit further. So we're still dealing with accusation number two. So while Israel has despised God's name, today we are going to see that the nations will honor and revere God's name and adore it. So if you were here a couple weeks ago when I preached through uh, th- that first, that second part of Malachi, this is going to sound, some of it's going to sound familiar to you, which is good. And hopefully we'll just add to what you learned and uh, came to believe last time, okay? Now, I want you to grab a hold of the title of the sermon. God's love for his name via the nations. God loves his name and he's causing his name to be loved by others. That is the nation's. If Israel will not love his name as God loves his name, then he will see to it that his name is loved as he loves his name. He will see that it's loved through other nations. And so that's why I titled the sermon, God's love for his name via the nations. Again, God worships himself. He does not worship us. It would be idolatry if God worshiped us over himself. He loves himself because he is the most praiseworthy being in the universe. He deserves Perfect worship. God deserves perfect obedience. He deserves perfect devotion, and nothing less will do. And that means you and I are in a, a quandary of sorts because we do not offer God perfect uh, obedience. We do not offer God perfection. Okay. Yet He is worthy of that. That's what His name deserves. It's what His character is to re- be, uh, to receive, and we have fallen short of that. And yet we see that God's name will be loved. God's name will be revered. And so God moves and God acts in history to cause his name to be loved through the nations. And so that he rightly gets what he deserves. And so that's why we've titled the sermon that God's love for his name via the nations. Now, the first thing we see in our text this morning is that God's name is honored among the nations. And uh, we're going to make it very clear how this happens. In verse 11, the Lord says this from the rising of the sun to its setting, my name will be great among the nations. And in every place incense will be offered to my name and a pure offering. For my name will be great among the nations, says the Lord of hosts. Now the phrase, from the rising of the sun to its setting, it's like saying from east to west. Which way is east? From east to west. Okay? The sun rises in the east, I believe. That way, right? And then sets over the ocean from our perspective. This phrase is meant to be an all-encompassing phrase Like when you say, man, I I looked high and low, right? It's meant to encompass, I looked everywhere. Or, man, I was, where were you today? I was at work all day and all night. It's it's meant to be something that's all-inclusive. The phrase east to west, in this case, is no different than saying the whole earth. The whole earth will honor my name. The nations from east to west, my name will be revered all across this planet. From all places, Jesus said this, that many will come from the east and the west, that is, the entire planet, from all nations, from all places, and they will recline at the table, at the feast with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. So God has in mind this global worship of his name. That's what God has always intended. It's from all locations, all over the world, that his name will be great. Brothers and sisters, that that is phenomenal to think about. You and I are mentioned in this passage, are we not? From the prophet's perspective, this is a future. My name will be honored among the nations. It's foretold in Malachi that the nations will acknowledge the greatness of God in contrast to the Israelites and the priests who were despising the name of God. So we're picking up on that contrast. You won't, they will. While they profane and despise the name of the Lord, God's name himself will be treated very differently among the nations. They will see him as great. His name is great. He will be worthy and is worthy of perfect worship and obedience and adoration and praise and love and devotion. 
Notice again that this is from the prophet's perspective. It's a future thing, which means it wasn't happening on a large scale during the time that this prophecy is taking place. So we need to understand that, okay? It wasn't being fulfilled just then. So the the Gentile nations, that is non-Israelite nations, are not yet acknowledging the great name of the Lord. Something to come. And so if Israel was not going to honor the great name of the Lord, somehow, some way, God would get the worship he deserves from non-Jewish nations. And so we should be asking, how? How could this be? What's going to cause them to revere the great name of God and to love him? Okay? Now, here's what we need to understand. The way that they were dishonoring God's name, Israel, is by offering impure sacrifices. So we might be tempted to think, well, maybe the Gentile nations will create their own temples, create their own sacrificial system. Maybe they'll do what the Jews weren't doing at that time and God's name will be honored. Well, that's one way to look at it, but that's not the correct way to see. But we should be asking the question, how could this be? How could this be? According to Deuteronomy 12, listen to this. Sacrifices to the Lord could only be offered in the place that God designated for the Israelites. That is the promised land. They weren't to offer them outside of the promised land. They were to offer them in accordance with tabernacle worship. According to God's law, sacrifices could only be offered by people that were designated by God. That is priests. According to God's law, the sacrifices had to meet specific qualifications in order to be pure. And so you couldn't offer them outside of the promised land or that would would ruin the whole thing. And so how is it that nations are going to be able to offer a pure offering and offer up the correct worship to God if everything they do in their land would automatically deem it defiled? Does that make sense, the question? What are they going to do? How are they going to do this? The law, the God's law won't permit them to do that. So this is a thing that we got to work out. Proper sacrificial worship of God had to be in the promised land with God's pure priests. They were to be pure themselves and pure sacrifices from the people. So what do we do? That means if sacrifices were impure, it was wrong. If the priest didn't do it appropriately, it was wrong. If it wasn't in the right place, it was wrong. And so we got the question, how then could God say that from east to west, all around the world, the Gentiles, the nations would offer incense and a pure offering to God? They had no priests. They had no temple. They had no special promised land. And so what were they to do? For them to do so would be contrary to the Mosaic law. Well, we know that God doesn't violate his law. So if they're going to do this, they would have to do it in a different way at a different time, something different than what God had outlined for the Jews in the Mosaic law. It would have to be different. It, it couldn't be according to this, uh, this law that God gave. It would have to be substantially different. Okay? So that means that there's a fundamental difference in the worship and offering that we see in the Mosaic covenant with the way the Gentiles would do their worship, a fundamental difference. And we're going to see that. And I think if we answer the question, why would foreigners, why would people from other nations honor God's name with incense and a pure offering? Why would they do that? And if we can answer that question, I think we'll see why their worship doesn't violate the Mosaic law. Okay. So let's, let's think about this question. God's honoring his name through the nations. Why would they do that? Why would they give him honor? Why would they give him praise for his nature and who he is? Why would they praise God for his faithfulness? Because that's part of God's nature. Why would they praise God for his justice? That's part of his attributes and his love and his grace and his patience and his power. Why would they praise God for who he is? His presence and his knowledge, his mercy, his kindness and wrath. How is it that they would come to know God in this way so that they could praise him properly? And the answer is this. Because God would save these people from his judgment. God would save the nations from his judgment. And that happens in the gospel of Jesus Christ, right? That's how that happens. It is in the gospel of Jesus Christ that you see all these attributes displayed. The gospel isn't just grace. It is so much more. God's wrath is displayed in the gospel and that it is diverted from us. That's part of the gospel story. Wrath's supposed to come to me diverted to Jesus Christ, all right? Uh, We get grace in the gospel. We get what we have not earned. We get mercy, meaning we don't get what we deserve, which is hell. In the gospel, we see God's kindness. We see God's love. 
right? We see God's patience as he waits for us to come to him. We see God granting us repentance and being a giving God and granting us faith. We see God's faithfulness to do what he promised way back in Malachi. It's in the gospel that we see so much of God's attributes. We see his power and that he has deemed this part of his program since the very beginning. And he's ensured that it's happening. And that not Satan or any demon or any country has thwarted the plan of God. And so we see his power at work in the gospel. We see his knowledge and that he is wise enough to carry this through. And again, nobody can stop him in his will. And he is faithful. All of this is displayed in the gospel so that people can properly praise the name of God and say, great is the name of the Lord. That's what the gospel reveals to the world. And you and I as Gentiles, except for the few Jewish people that we have here, right? But we all have reason to praise God, to love his name. People from many nations are represented here this morning. And Malachi's words are literally fulfilled in our worship this morning and in our, in our lives, we are showing the worthiness and awesomeness of God. We are holding him in his name in high regard because of Christ, because of Christ and only through Christ. Okay? Apart from Christ, our worship means nothing to God. Okay? It is only because of Christ and through Christ that we may worship him properly. Okay? You see, in the Old Testament, in the New Testament, Messiah's kingdom has never, ever been about Israel alone. And, and although when we read the Old Testament, we primarily see Israel, the Old Testament is not about Israel. The Old Testament is about Jesus Christ. It is about God's salvation plan for the world. Okay, And they are the supporting actor in this story of Jesus Christ rescuing sinners. It was never Israel only. And then, oh, by, by the way, I think I'll add Gentiles to the kingdom. From Scripture's perspective, God has always had in mind the salvation of not just Jewish people, but Gentiles or non-Jews. Israel was chosen by God as a special nation in the Old Testament, but it wasn't chosen like many of us think or have been taught. Some of us have been taught wrong. Some people think that Israel was chosen by God, and somehow that means that every Israelite ever that has ever lived is saved and going to be with God in the eternal kingdom. And that's just not the case. That's not what is meant when it says that God chose Israel as a nation. Okay? He chose them for a specific purpose. He set his affection on them, yes. He chose them to be a special people, yes. But that choosing did not mean all were saved. It meant that they were chosen to be the vehicle by which the Savior would come into the world and bless the world with salvation. It meant that they were chosen to be a peculiar people, that by the covenant that God would make with them, the Mosaic covenant, that they would, that the world and they would see through their worship and ceremonies and sacrifices and holy days and government and priesthood and laws and culture, they would see through all of this what it means to be sinful before God and how they can be cleansed before God through a mediator, through a sacrifice, through the promised one that they were waiting for through them, through Jesus Christ. That's why they were chosen, to be a living picture of how God saves people through their culture. And whenever they turned from this, the world didn't have that living picture. And God wanted the world to have that picture. So when they turned from this, God punished them so that they would have enough of his judgment and turn back to the right way of worship that would herald to the world Jesus Christ. Are you with me on that? That's why God's blessings and sanctions are so important in the Old Testament. You're, you'll be blessed if you do this. I, I, I'm calling you to do this. I've chosen you for this. So what Malachi says in, in, in Scripture is not novel. Salvation has always been for the nations. Go back with me to the Adamic covenant, to the very beginning of Scripture. When, when, uh, remember when Adam failed to be perfect before God, which is what we're all supposed to do? He failed to be perfect before God, so God cursed him. He cursed Eve. He cursed the planet. And we have all sinned ever since. Right after that, Adam's fall, the Messiah was promised in Genesis 3.15. Let me ask you, did that happen before or after God initiated and created the Jewish nation? It was before. Messiah was for all nations, from the very first humans that ever inhabited this planet. Messiah was promised to all of us. Later, we see the account of Noah and the flood. God saved Noah. And at the same time, he judged the world in one and the same act. 
God's reign was judgment upon the world. But in that reign, God pulled Noah away from the world, if you will, and delivered Noah from the world. That salvation was judgment at the same time, depending on who God was rescuing or saving. The New Testament teaches us that God knows how to save the godly while punishing the ungodly. He can do both at the same time, and that's what he does. And then it points back to Noah as an illustration of both salvation and judgment, that salvation judgment moment that happened with the flood. And the covenant that God made with Noah and all humanity is that God would never judge the world by a flood again. Next time, fire will come, and we will be delivered from the world when judgment comes. We will be plucked out of it, all right? The point being that God intended for Noah's deliverance through a judgment flood upon the world That that was meant to illustrate final salvation and judgment for all humanity, not just for Israel. This all happened before Israel was born. That illustration of judgment and salvation upon the world. When God initiated the covenant with Abraham, he promised that all the nations would be blessed through Abraham. And so God had in mind the nations, not just Israel, when he established his covenant with Abraham. In Galatians 3.8, this is... This is one of my favorite verses in the the New Testament because it just sheds light on all the Old Testament. In Galatians 3, 8, Scripture says, all right, that Scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, Scripture preached, all right, God preached the gospel before him to Abraham, saying, in you, Abraham, shall all the nations be blessed. Let me read that Scripture again. Scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, In you shall all the nations be blessed. That is what God was telling Abraham when he said, In you all the nations shall be blessed. What did God mean? That God was going to justify the Gentiles by faith. Okay? God had in mind the salvation of the Gentile nations. So I'm not sure if you're picking up what God was laying down to Abraham. What is justification by faith? What does that mean? For some of you, that might be a new phrase. What is justification? Let me explain that. So that way you can see what God was telling Abraham prior to the Jewish nation even being formed. Okay? Justification. That is how God declares you just. Justification is how God declares you righteous. How God declares you perfect. And you're thinking, but I'm not perfect. I do a lot of bad things. And if you're honest with yourself, you will say that. You lie, you steal, you cheat, you backstab people, okay? You gossip, you, you profane the name of the Lord, you, you curse, you say vile things. We look at vile things, we hear vile things, we go vile places. You and I sin. We're not nice to our spouses. And honestly, parents, sometimes we're not nice to our kids either, right? And kids, man, you're jacked up to your parents, right? We're sinners, you, are, you should be the worst person you know because you know what's in your head. So how is it that God's going to declare you a good person when you're not and I'm not? That's what, that's what justification is. How does God do this? Okay, He does it, first of all, by forgiving us of our sin and removing it from us. That sin is placed upon Jesus Christ, removed from us, placed on Jesus Christ. Jesus is treated as a sinner on the cross. Even though he's not a sinner, he's treated as one. He was de-justified. If you will. He bore our sin on his body on that tree. So that we could become the righteousness of God. So that we could become just. So that we could become perfect. How so? Scripture says by faith. Faith is the word for trust. Confidence. I trust that Jesus is my savior. Only he can save me. And when you put your trust in Jesus. Knowing that your sins were transferred to him. His good deeds, his perfect deeds, because Jesus never sinned, are transferred to you. You can't see this invisible switch, this transfer of sin to him and righteousness to you. So now, with no sin in your account, and just the righteousness and perfection of Jesus in your account, how does God look at you? As just. Scripture, right, says... That God preached the gospel to Abraham when he, God says the nations will be blessed through you, Abraham. God was talking about justifying, declaring Gentile nations, Gentile people just through faith in Christ. That's what God had before the nation of Israel was ever formed. When God picked that first representative, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and then Israel spread out from there. 
the salvation plan of the Gentiles has always been in God's plan. Raise your hand if you're not Jewish. This is God's plan to rescue you. This is why you are here this morning worshiping the great name of God. This is why you, because of the righteousness of Christ, this is why you can stand before God as perfect and give God what he deserves. Not because you're, you are perfect, because God sees you as the perfect Jesus Christ, the son of God. This is how you worship God properly. It's only because of Jesus Christ and through Jesus Christ. If you don't believe in Jesus Christ, you can come to God. You don't have cleansing. You don't have his righteousness. And you stand before God with filthy, impure sacrifices saying, here I am, Lord, receive me. And God says, you despise my name. You have not brought me what I deserve. I deserve perfection. And since we can't bring perfection ourselves, we need the perfection of Jesus Christ to approach God. That's the gospel story. That's what this, this is why we praise God properly, because of what Jesus did for us. This is phenomenal, okay? This is all throughout the Old Testament, that God was going to save people through this promised Messiah, okay? It's an amazing story. I never get tired of hearing it. For the Adamic covenant, Noah, Noahic covenant, Abrahamic covenant, we see that God always had in mind the salvation of the Gentiles. Even in the Mosaic covenant, while the Jews specifically, this is for them, It was meant to teach them how God reconciles them and the nations to himself as they would come to trust in the Messiah who was their substitute profession and sacrifice. Abraham had this gospel preached to him in some measure. Maybe it didn't include all of this because there was more information added to this and more revelation added to what God first told Abraham. But the gospel as it stood then was nothing less than the nations being blessed by God through Abraham's seed, singular Singular, through Abraham's seed, Jesus, to come. And so this is what the Old Testament was all about. Even the Davidic covenant, a promised Messiah that would rule forever over all. It was intended to bless the nations this way too, with a proper ruler. And thank God one day, this planet will have a proper ruler. I think, I, think, I mean, ever since I've young, been young, I just remember bad leaders in any part of society. Right? That's not one party or the other, just bad people lead this world and they don't rule the way God wants. And one day the Lord will come and he will rule with justice. And I'm excited for that time. So the church consisting primarily of Gentiles is what Malachi is talking about. And what Malachi says next is that he says that in every place, not just in Israel, but in every place, incense will be offered to his name and not just incense, but a pure offering. It's important that you pay attention to that. Not just incense, but a pure offering, and it's singular. Do you see that? It's not plural. It's not offerings like the Israelites had to offer. The Gentiles will bring an offering singular to God in some sense. Now, in regards to incense, we just sang a song, The Prayers of the Saints. Revelation talks about the prayers of the saints going up to God like incense. In in the Old Testament, incense... Uh, the priests of Israel were to daily offer up incense to the Lord. Incense going up to the Lord was a symbol of prayer that the priests offered up to God on behalf of the Israelites. In regards to offerings, we've already seen from the last sermon that the Israelites were to bring the priests perfect offerings that the priests were to inspect. And again, that perfect offering was to be the substitute perfection that the Israelites themselves could not bring. So while we say God is worthy of perfect worship, what we don't mean is that you got to do better at your worship. That you ha- can't have any mistakes in your worship. And that's how sometimes people preach this passage. God is worthy of your, perfe- your perfect worship, but the problem is, is you can't bring perfect worship to God because you're tainted with sin. And so the Israelites couldn't present themselves to God, so they're saying, here's... Here's something perfect, Lord, a perfect sacrifice that represents what I should have done. I cannot do. And so it's, it's what you deserve, perfection. It's, it's my substitute. And then that sacrifice would die in the place because they deserve death. So it was both their perfection substitute and their death substitute. And we saw that the priests weren't inspecting the offerings that the Israelites brought. They got tired of doing this. They got tired of living out the gospel pictures and so they were bringing these garbage junk sacrifices to God and again that's no different than you standing before God saying here I am this is my perfection this is my offering this is the best I have to give you 
and God won't accept that. That's why you and I are worthy of death. We deserve to die for our sins. And that's why the Israelites had to do this. It was painting a picture of Jesus who would stand before us in perfection and who would be crucified on our behalf. And that's why we Gentiles, that's the offering that we say, Lord, this is, this is the offering. I, I, I have nothing else to give you. If I give you me, I'm damned. Jesus Christ is my perfection. And of course, because of that, we know that God forgives us and saves us and we continue to love and grow in our love of God. And we offer up worship. Although it's flawed, we offer up worship to God through Christ because of Christ. Again, the Israelites were doing their whole, uh, doing the whole Mosaic uh, covenant wrong. Okay? They were bringing impure sacrifices to God, saying, be merciful to me, God. Be gracious to me. All right? And it wasn't working. It was all wrong. All this was supposed to point forward to Jesus Christ, and they weren't doing what God asked them to do. Okay? So we see the Israelites. We see them bringing diseased and crippled and, and lame animals. Priests weren't inspecting them. And that's why they, it said that they despise the name of God. They, they hate the name of God. And so you have these priests who are supposed to be mediators. Here's God, here's Israel, and the priests are in between, supposed to be mediators between God and Israel, praying to God on behalf of the Israelites, supposedly declaring, God, you are worthy of perfection. You are worthy of greatness. Please forgive us, forgive them on the basis of these garbage sacrifices, Lord. We ask for your grace and your favor. You're worthy of perfection. Here's junk, though, God. Give me grace. Give me favor. And we see that God was displeased, that he would rather the temple doors be shut. They weren't proclaiming the worthiness of God, were they, in their sacrifices? In their garbage sacrifices, what are they saying? You are not worthy of anything more than this, God. I don't know about you, this blows my mind when I see the connection of Malachi to the gospel and its connection to us. Malachi says, in every place, all nations, incense will be offered to my name. That is to say, right prayers, non-hypocritical prayers going up to God. Prayers going up to God without any need for an Israelite priest. The prayers of the saints offered to God's name, to God directly. Prayers brought to God, and not just prayers, but a pure offering. Okay, so I think now that we understand the point of the burnt offerings, we have to make sure that we don't misapply it. So I'm going to say this again. For the Israelites, their application was you need to bring pure and proper sacrifices because this represents the Lord Jesus Christ, right? We, we can see that now. So the application for us then is to not look and say, I, I got to do better. I got to I got to be better in my behavior like they had to be better. That's not the application. The application is I need a perfect representation before me. Therefore, I must believe that Jesus Christ is my perfection. That's the application for us today. Okay, The Lord is my perfection. The Lord is my death. Therefore, on the basis of my substitute, I plead for mercy and forgiveness, grace, and life. And church, this is the basis for how we are able to offer to continue prayers to God. By his name, through Jesus, Yeshua, his name, God, is my salvation. So we come to God through the one who is God, who is our salvation. And we plead for God to save us based on his righteousness, based on his death, based on his resurrection. And so in every place, in every nation, the name of the Lord will be great among the people who offer repentant prayers to God through the pure and righteous offering and sacrifice of Christ. Okay, so why are we able to pray this morning like we did? It's not because we participate in Old, uh, Old Testament sacrifice or rituals. It's because we believe in Jesus Christ of whom the Old Testament pointed forward to. That's how we offer prayers to God because of his pure offering that was offered to God on our behalf. And it wasn't a sinful priest church. These priests that were offering up blemish sacrifices, they were negating, they were abrogating their duties. They were pushing them to the side. They were being sinful. And in Jesus, who is our great high priest, he does not offer a sinful sacrifice. He offers himself. And he does not offer it sinfully because he himself is perfect. And so in Christ, we have a perfect priest who never tires of his, his, uh, his duty to save us. It never becomes wearisome to him. And he offers himself once and for all, and it's done. Okay? So just as the Israelite priests had mediators between them and God, 
we Gentiles, we have a mediator between us and God. That is, people from all nations have someone standing between us and God. And that is the God-man, Jesus Christ. He is our great high priest. He's not like the Old Testament high priest who had to offer sacrifices over and over again and had to offer sacrifices for themselves. They did. Why? Because they were sinful. Jesus doesn't have to offer a sacrifice for himself, and he doesn't have to offer it repeatedly. He alone is the perfect priest who does it all for us. The scripture says those who call upon the name of the Lord, they will be saved. They're call- when you call in the name of the Lord, you aren't, just, you aren't just doing some mystical practices, just saying, Jesus. Listen, when you have a relative on your, their deathbed or a friend, you don't hey, just call upon the name of Jesus. Just say Jesus and he'll save you. That's not what this means. When you call upon the name of the Lord, you are calling on the character of God who is righteous. You are calling upon the only one who can save you based on what Jesus Christ has done for you. That's what it means to call upon the name of the Lord. And so the gospel must be presented in that if they are to properly call upon the Lord. It's not saying five letters, J-E-S-U-S, that save somebody. It is calling upon the trustworthy sacrifice of Jesus Christ. And so we need to make sure that we understand that. But those who do call upon the name of the Lord are saved. And that's why we listen to his word. That's why we come on Sunday mornings to hear more of this Savior. In church, scripture says that God, his name, it will be great among the nations. This is what the Lord of hosts says. The God of angel army says this. God loves his name. He loves his essence, his attributes. And he gets that love for his name. He ensures that his name is loved by sending Jesus to be our perfection and sacrifice so that we praise him. That's that's what he does. That's how God gets the worship he rightly deserves. This planet was made to declare the fame of God and it will happen. We secondly, we see this in verse 12. We see God's name honored by perfect sacrifice, not corrupt sacrifice. That God's name is honored by perfect sacrifice, not corrupt sacrifice. Verse 12 says, listen, you profane my name when you say that the Lord's table is polluted. And it's fruit, that is the food, it's food may be despised. And you say, but what a weariness this is. And you snort at it, says the Lord of hosts. You bring what has been taken by violence or is lame and sick, and you bring... This as your offering. Shall I accept that from your hand, says the Lord? Now, we've already covered a lot of this in our previous sermon, so we're not going to get so much in depth like we did last time. Okay? But we see how God's name gets honored, which encompasses belief in, the Jesus, in Jesus Christ as Savior. We see God's name honored by perfect sacrifice. And even though the text doesn't say that God's name is honored by uh, perfect sacrifice, we see that it is dishonored. By corrupt sacrifices. So if that's true, that God's name is honored by, dishonored by corrupt sacrifices, then the reverse must be true, which is God's name is honored by appropriate sacrifice. Okay? Every command has a reverse to it. If, if we are not to lie, then that means we are to tell the truth. If we are to not steal, then that means we are to work or we are to be giving. Every command has a flip side. And so when we see that God's name is dishonored by corrupt sacrifice, we see that uh, God's name would be honored by perfect sacrifice. Okay? So we've already covered this. So the it being profaned in verse 12, you profane it. That's, that's the name of God. Profane is not a word that we use a lot, but we know what profanity is, right? I, I don't have to use an example. You guys probably had plenty of examples coming from your lips this morning, or maybe not this morning. Maybe this week you had a rough week and some profanity came out. All right? It happens to all of us. All right? But you understand what profanity is? It's, the, it's using language in a dirty or a filthy or a vulgar way, right? To profane something then means to treat something as dirty. To defile something. To desanctify it. To treat it as unholy. To treat it as common or worthless or insignificant. That's how God's name is being treated by these improper sacrifices. We saw how the Gentiles will honor God's name by belief in Christ, by trust in Christ. Yet here we see that the Israelites are profaning, ruining God's name, dragging it through the mud. How? By saying God's table is polluted. God's table, the altar where sacrifices were done. How is it the priests are saying that God's table or altar of sacrifice is polluted or desecrated? I don't think they would admit it, but the reality is that this is what they're saying. They're saying it's okay to offer despised or contemptible or worthless offerings and sacrifices and food 
metaphorically fruit. The scripture is using that word. It's okay to offer this to God. And so the process goes like this. The thought process, all right? God's talking to the priest. You accept nasty sacrifices. You, priest, accept nasty sacrifices, which means you think the Lord's table is worthless. If it was worth something, you wouldn't put a nasty sacrifice on there. But since you accept nasty sacrifices and you put it on God's table, you despise the table as well, the altar of sacrifice. By that, that means you think I'm worthless. You think I'm junk. Because that's, that stuff's offered to me. Is that what you think I'm worthy of? And so this is, this is angering God. They think God is nasty and worthless by their offering. Do you hear that? This means, what does this mean for us? It means when you reject God's means of reconciling to him, God has deemed a way for you to be made right before him. And when you reject that, it means you think Jesus Christ is worthless. It means you think the cross was worthless and what he did for you. You would rather bring your good deeds to God instead of the perfect Jesus Christ and say, here I am, God. And what that says is you think God is nasty. You think God is worthless. You think God is garbage. And this is what every world religion does. Just be good. Just be better. You'll be okay on judgment day. No, you won't. God will say, you despise me. You hate me. How so? You, you brought me you with your sin. I'm worthy of perfection. That's my name. I'm God Almighty. I'm the Lord of hosts, the God of angel armies. Who do you think you are talking to and dealing with? Man, that's heavy. You see why our friends need saving? They, they've been lied to by the world thinking that they can just bring themselves with their, well, as long as you're being sincere. Sincerity won't make you right before God. Only Christ will. Only Christ will. And on Judgment Day, that's all you can hope for is that Christ is your advocate. That he argues on your behalf, Lord, that treat them as me. They are perfect. I've given them my righteousness. They trust in me to save them. They're forgiven. That, that's it. That's what this passage is trying to teach us. Not to offer ourselves to God. That's, that's what these priests were basically doing by offering garbage sacrifices on behalf of the Israelites. And these priests, they don't love his name. They're willing to accept imperfect sacrifice on behalf of the Israelites. The Israelites don't love his name. That's why Jesus is sinless and righteousness matter. Because that's how God's name is honored when we, bring, when we come to God on the basis of Jesus' perfection. The priests, they responded to God's accusation when he, when he hits them between the eyes with this. They're like, what a weariness this is, Lord. They snored at it. They snored at what the Lord of hosts has laid down as the guidelines for how they are to approach him and be reconciled to him. What a weariness this is. That is to say, what a hardship, God. How exhausting this is, Lord, these priests. How tiresome. This is too much work. They snore or they sniff or probably, uh, probably more properly, they blow air out of their nostrils when, when God says this to them. You know how when someone says something and you kind of scoff at them and you're like... You, you blow it. I mean, I don't want to do it too hard. Might, something might shoot out right now, right? But you, know, you just let that sigh of error out of disgust and contempt. God says, you, you offer him pure sacrifices. Oh, Lord, this is a lot to demand. Like a sigh through the nose. That's what priests are doing in regards to the work the Lord has for them. God, it's too much to inspect these offerings. It's easier just to let everything slide. When God asked them to do their jobs properly, they huff and puff. And they're supposed to be pictures of Jesus, the great high priest. And in their mediation, they're supposed to represent, be pictures of Christ between God and people. They are to offer pure offerings of sacrifice, which pictures Jesus as well. All this is to show them how they can be saved. And they're like, it's too much. Really? It's too much. It's too much work. What they don't see is that these perfect sacrifices, they represent the one who will do all the work for them. That's all they're doing is just painting a picture of Jesus who's actually going to do all the work without fail. It would be Jesus who would come and do all the work of obeying God's law perfectly. It would be Jesus who kept the entire Mosaic law without fail. And he never huffed and puffed. 
He never failed. It would be Jesus who did what Adam failed to do in the garden. Stay away from evil. It would be Jesus who would do for you and I what we could never do. To love and obey God perfectly. He would do all the work. And that's what the priests were missing. Their duties pointed toward the fact that Christ would do all the work for them in salvation. And they say it's just too much. It's easier, God, to offer whatever the people bring than for us to skip the inspection process. And speaking both to priests and Israelites, God says they bring him animals taken by violence. That is to say that they bring animals to God that they have taken from others by force. They bring stolen offerings to God, not just lame or sick offerings. With those lame, sick, disease animals, that all represented sin and imperfection. So not only are they just doing that, now they're bringing stolen offerings. This wouldn't be accepted by the Lord either, even if it was a perfect sacrifice. This is, this is very important to get. They're bringing good stuff to God, some of them are, but it's been stolen. We saw in our last sermon, God didn't receive lame or sick animals. Now they're bringing stolen sacrifices. So why wouldn't the Lord accept these stolen sacrifices, even if they were perfect? Here's what you need to understand. To bring a perfect sacrifice to God by sinful means, that shows contempt for God as well. And we're going to make the connection of what this means to us. To bring a perfect sacrifice to God in sinful means shows contempt for God as well. God, I don't want to give you what I have, they were saying, so I'll steal something for you. That shows that God is not worthy of their devotion and they spies him. Now, there's a second reason why the Lord wouldn't accept their perfect stolen offerings. It showed no repentance. It showed no turning away from sin, did it? Their offering to God. It's to approach God with a perfect sacrifice that they stole and say, Lord, forgive me of my sins. I'm stealing a sacrifice so that I can get mercy from you. Did you see the hypocrisy in that? Okay. In order for the Lord to receive the sacrifice on their behalf, they needed to be broken and contrite over their sin. That is, that is the heart and the spirit that the Lord will not despise or reject, Scripture says. He will not despise or reject a broken and contrite heart. He receives only those who turn from sin and trust his means of atonement and redemption. The Lord demands his rule and reign over everyone's life. He does. He demands all of you. And if they will not submit to him as Lord, then he would not forgive them and receive the sacrifice that they brought, even if it was perfect. And their stealing sacrifices proves that they really weren't repenting and turning to God as the Lord of their life. Church, I don't know if you can see the correlation, but the same truths that we, that we preach in the New Testament, they're taught into us in the Old Testament. The Lord will not save you just because you mouth some words and confess that Jesus is Savior. He requires that you repent of your sin. He requires that you submit to him as Lord. Those who are saved, Romans tells us, are those who confess that God has raised Jesus from the dead, but they also, these same people, they confess that he is Lord. That confession of Lord is all wrapped up in that same sentence, that he rules over their lives. And that's what repentance is. It's our confession that we are not the boss of our lives now, that the Lord is. He is our king. He is our sovereign. He is our creator. He is our maker. We acknowledge that. We aren't rulers over our lives anymore. And we're saying, I won't live the way I want to live anymore. I will no longer sin. We're repenting of that. I will live under your rule, God. And so scripture says that we submit to his lordship. And that we must believe that Jesus was crucified, buried, and risen again. That's what Romans 10 teaches us. That if we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord, that's repentance, and we believe in our heart that God's raised him from the dead, that's faith, then we are saved. We must turn from sin and we must believe. They're, they're flip sides to the same coin. Faith on one side, repentance on the other. We're not justified by repentance. We're only justified by faith. That's a big distinction to make. Nevertheless, we cannot be saved if we do not repent. Okay? And we can turn from sin, and if we don't trust in Jesus Christ, we're not saved. You must do both. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The kingdom of God is here. Turn from self-rule. Turn to his rule as Lord, believing that Jesus died and rose again. And that's precisely why God saved 
won't save those who only say that Jesus is their Savior. They must repent as well. You cannot just mouth a prayer and say, Jesus, save me, and then continue to act like the devil the rest of your life and then expect to stand before God on Judgment Day and be saved. You must repent. You must come to him as Lord. So when you go back to the Israelites, they're offering violently stolen sacrifices to the Lord for atonement. Now you can see why God won't accept their sacrifices, even if they were perfect. They had not repented of sin and were hoping God would forgive them. And it's not going to happen that way. It's very important that you see both repentance from rebellion, repentance towards God, and faith in God's perfect sacrifice. That's what God accepts in order to save you. And that's why God asked the rhetorical question, shall I accept that from your hand, this violent sacrifice, the sacrifice that you stole? Shall I accept that? The answer is no. God's name is dishonored with those sacrifices and will only be honored with a repentant heart with the right sacrifice. And if the answer is no, then God has not received that stolen or blemished sacrifice. That means the Israelites would remain under the curse and the judgment of God and the curse of the Lord, just like anyone today who does not repent and doesn't trust Jesus as Savior. They remain under God's judgment. So we see that God's name is honored among the nations. We see how God's name is honored through perfect sacrifice, not corrupt or stolen sacrifices, but only right sacrifice, namely the sacrifice of Jesus. But we see lastly that God's name is honored in judgment. God honors his name in judgment as well, not just salvation. Verse 14 says, Cursed be the cheat who has a male in his flock, and he vows it. He promises to give it to God. It's in his flock. And yet, he sacrifices to the Lord what is blemished. I am a great king, says the Lord. Because I am a great king, for I am a great king, says the Lord of hosts. And my name will be honored, and it will be feared among the nations. So please understand this. I want to paint a picture for you. The temple where the sacrifices were made. This is where God dwelled on the earth. The Ark of the Covenant, the Ark of the Promise, we've already gone over what it contained in previous sermons. It's in this special room called the Holy of Holies, the most holy place. So the temple is where God dwelled among the Israelites. The Ark of the Covenant is inside the most holy place in the temple. And this was the earthly throne of God, so to speak, the throne of God. In Deuteronomy 12.10, we see that the Israelites that they were going to inherit the land that God had given to them. They hadn't gotten it yet, but they're about to inherit it. And God says, after I give you this land, I'm going to give you rest from your enemies. This promised land, God says, listen to this, where they would dwell, where sacrifices would be given, where they would have rest from their enemies, God says, this is going to be the place where my name dwells. The place where my name dwells. It was in that land that God says, that that's where my name dwells and that's where I'm going to command you to give burnt offerings. And that's where you're going to give contributions and that's where you're going to give your offerings and your tithes. The the land that I give you, the land where my name dwells. That's an interesting thing to contemplate, don't you think? God's name, where it's supposed to be honored. It's tied to the promised land. God's name, it's who he is. He has connected himself to this land, to this temple, to this room in this temple, to the Ark of the Covenant in this special room. God intended for all of this to honor his name, his person. It was there to magnify, to show us and to show the world how worthy he is of adoration and praise. And that's the point of Israel's worship and lifestyle and covenant. It shows God to be worthy. His name was worthy of devotion and perfection. And the Israelites are bringing him nasty sacrifices. This guy, whoever it was, or many people are bringing violently stolen animals when he has a perfectly good one in the flock. All right. It results in not just God's rejection of the sacrifice, but it results in God's curse upon the one who brought it. Cursed be the cheat. Cursed be the cheat who has promised to give me something perfect and they give me a stolen animal. Cursed be the cheat. God, you and your name are holy. You and your name are glorious. You and your name are praiseworthy and to be honored. So here's more garbage, God. I'm not going to give you what I have. You're not worthy of what I have. I'm just going to steal it from someone else. God's response we've seen is shut the temple doors. You may not come into my presence. I will not allow it. They remained under his judgment, and that is a fearful and terrible thing to comprehend. They don't get to approach God. They don't get to approach God. They get no grace. They get no mercy. They get no fellowship with God. They don't get to come near him. Instead, they remain under his judgment, under his wrath. 
They are violating God's covenant and dishonoring his name. And so God promised curses upon them when they acted like this. They were doomed. They tried by their own efforts, and they would not ascend the hill of the Lord. He told them that they would be blessed and forgiven when they were properly reconciled to him through the means that, they, that he gave them. But instead, they have contempt for him. They have re- rejected him as leader and sovereign over their lives and savior over them. They've rejected his method, and so God rejected them. And they would not get what they needed. They needed grace. They needed mercy. Instead, they would rightly get judgment. And in that judgment, God would honor his name. I'm not worthy of your garbage, and so I refuse it. You will not taint my name. You, you've brought me bad sacrifices. You despise my table, which means you despise me. I will not let my name be despised like that. You, you will be judged. Cursed are you. God will uphold the integrity of his name. He will judge sinners. He will punish evildoers. And the way that we avoid that is through Jesus Christ. And that honors his name as well. God is a great king. His name will be honored, he says. You can't stop that. I can't stop that. And if the Israelites would not honor his name by coming to him properly, then God would provide the perfect sacrifice of Jesus Christ as he has always planned so that they could approach him in the perfection of Jesus and that God's name would get what he rightly deserved. And that's what Jesus does for his church. He gives God what he deserves, which is perfection. And that's why we're able to approach our Lord. In our receiving of salvation, in our receiving of reconciliation, and receiving of grace and mercy and restoration, we honor our great king. That's how you honor God, by receiving Jesus Christ as Savior. You turn from your sin, you believe in him, and this is why the preaching of Christ is so essential. This is why we talk about this all the time. It's what Christ came to do for us so that God would get the love his name deserves. In Christ, the Lamb of God, Scripture says he stands in our place every day interceding for us, giving perfect glory to God. Aren't you glad for that? While we're down here screwing up and sinning, Jesus is mediating for us and never stopping. Man, he doesn't huff and puff. He just keeps doing what a Savior is supposed to do. And that pleases him. And that honors God. Thank God for him. Thank God for him. He's a sinless priest, always working on our behalf. He doesn't complain. And he does this so that the Father gets what he deserves, which is loving obedience always and forever. And this results in one day, the Lord standing with us, us before God. And instead of casting us into outer darkness, the Lord will say, come on into the, come on into the joy of my presence. Come on in. That's the only way we can approach God, church, is because of Jesus' perfection. You know, church, Scripture also teaches us a few other things. God's love is, for His name is so great, He's going to get that love through the nations. The Scripture teaches that the nations, as they love God, that this is creating jealousy in Israel. Right now, as a whole, Israel does not trust Christ as their Savior. They're currently, as a, as a whole, despising their name, despising the name of God, even though our, there are some who do love the name of the Lord and do believe in Jesus Christ. And so what we need to do is we need to pray that more Israelites will come home to their Savior, Jesus Christ, to the Messiah that was promised through them to bless us. We need to pray that we need to take the Messiah back to them. God will do this. Scripture tells us that God will rescue Israel. And so we look forward to that. I pray that we'll get to see it in our lifetime, that we see the day that they no longer despise the name of the Lord, but come to him as Savior. And they offer up incense to God, repentant prayers, perfect prayers to God through Jesus, trusting in the one pure offering that was made on our behalf. For those that don't honor the name of Christ, I want to invite you and I want to plead with you to trust Christ today. Honor his name by believing that Jesus Christ is the Savior, that he is the sinless priest, that he is the sinless sacrifice, that he is perfect for you, Because to approach him in any other way is to despise the name of the Lord. And that will bring judgment upon you. You cannot find yourself in a worse position than to be apart from God, apart from Christ. You don't want to be under the wrath of Almighty God. And here you are today, and God has sent his word to you. That you might repent and be saved before that great and fearful day of judgment. And so if you're not giving God proper honor by trusting in Jesus Christ, I pray that today that you would confess him as Lord that Jesus Christ was raised from the dead on your behalf, that he died for your sins so that you can be reconciled to God because God loves his name and he will honor it in judgment and he will honor it in salvation. 
And so I pray, pray that you would know Christ today as Savior. And Christian, this is something we've already realized. God helped us to understand this. So what do we do? Well, we continue to love the gospel. We continue to love Christ for what he's done. For what he's done. We recognize and continue to recognize God's great love for us and his love for his name. The love that he foretold the nations would give him at Malachi. And this is your story. This is about God. This is about you. This is very personal. Malachi is. So this morning, we're going to sing a couple final songs. And so I invite you to praise God with us. And would you pray that God's ethnic people, as we sing these songs, the Israelites, would you pray, church, that they would come to Christ and honor his name. And pray that people all over the world would continue to come to Jesus Christ. There are still nations that need to hear of Jesus Christ. That's why we pray for them every Sunday. You should want God's name honored. You should want to give to that cause. You should want to pray to that end. To love God and to give him the worth he so rightly deserves, there's nothing greater that we were created for. So we need to do that. But let's do that properly through Jesus Christ. All right? Let us pray.